My name is Dr. Malakshmi. I'm a consultant ENT surgeon, and today I'll be talking to you about chronic sinusitis. Let's look at the keywords. You should remember there are different types of sinusitis: acute, chronic, and subacute. There are various treatment options, of which the most important in the case of chronic sinusitis is functional endoscopic sinus surgery. Now let's look at a case scenario. A patient present with history of a vague facial pain, right-sided headache, history of not having fever at all, and a purulent nasal discharge. Let's look at the definition of chronic sinusitis. Sinus infections lasting for months to years is usually called chronic sinusitis and the most common cause is usually because of the inability of an acute infection to resolve. The pathophysiology, acute infection, destroys the ciliary epithelium and impairs drainage. It causes pooling and stagnation of secretions inside the sinuses. This starts inviting infections, bacterial, and the persistence of these infections leading to loss of cilia, edema, and polyps. So these are the things which are usually seen. Pathology, the process of destruction and healing occurs simultaneously and one by one. The sinus mucosa becomes thick and polypoidal. Hypertrophic sinusitis and atrophic sinusitis follow simultaneously. Submucosa gets infiltered with lymphocytes and plasma cells which are usually suggestive of a chronic infection. Microabscesses, granulations, and fibrosis ensue. If you look at the bacteriology, it is usually mixed infections of both aerobic and anaerobic type. The clinical features are usually vague, but not much of headache and facial pain, no fever, purulent nasal discharge, foul swelling discharge, nasal stuffiness and anosmia. If you look at the diagnosis, we can either diagnose it with the help of x-rays and CT scans of the paranasal sinuses. Treatment is important. You will first try to do a culture and sensitivity of the pus. You will give them antibiotics, anti-inflammatory and anti-allergic drugs with the nasal decongestants and also do a procedure called functional endoscopic sinus surgery. Usually the surgery for chronic sinusitis is done in chronic maxillary. There's usually antral punctures, intranasal antrostomies and cadmillic procedures which involves the passing of a drill and removing a part of the canine fossa and therefore entering directly into the maxillary sinus. This is a typical feature of what you see in an x-ray of the paranasal sinuses. Let's look at the surgery of chronic frontal. You can do intranasal drainage, trephination of the frontal sinus, external ethmoidectomies, and osteoplastic flaps. The typical picture of a trephination of the frontal sinus. In the case of chronic ethmoidal, you can do intranasal and external ethmoidectomies. Surgery for chronic ethmoidal, can all, chronic sphenoidal is usually sphenoidotomy. Now what is FEST? This is a very important topic for you. Functional endoscopic sinus surgery, where there's endoscopic removal of the hypertrophic mucosa which blocks the sinuses, leading to giving rise to middle meatal. You have to give, you have to do a middle meatal antrostomy, ethmoidectomy, and sphenoid, and you try to remove parts of the mucosa so that you can make the sphenoid or any other sinuses devoid of this hypertrophic mucosa, which causes the blockage and other clinical features. This is a typical appearance of a FES, uh, how it is done, where the doctor stands on the right side or the left side of the patient, depending on his hand preference. The patient is lying in a slightly inclined position. The endoscope is held in one of the hands and the instruments are held in the other hand. And you have monitors to see all these procedures which you do in a higher basis. Let's go to the MCQs. Just remember one of these. What are the clinical features of acute chronic sinusitis? All of these are except for the nasal discharge is surely there. There is nasal stuffiness. There is no fever. There is anosmia. There is a complications of sinusitis. Let's look at each complication one by one. The beginning of what is orbital complications. We should remember that the orbit is very, very closely related to all the sinuses. The ethmoids, the frontal and the maxillary, all of them are in close proximity to the globe and to the parts of the orbit. They are separated only by a very thin bone, which is called the lamina papyracea, as its name suggests, a paper thin bone. So the infection can spread by osteitis as well as thrombophlebitis. There are two types, inflammatory edema, in which there is no erythema. On examination, there's simply tenderness, a slight movement, and the vision is actually normal. An upper lip only may be slightly swollen. The second type of complication, which increases in degree, is a subperiosteal abscess, in which there is pus just outside the bone, inside the bone, and inside it's under pressure. It displaces the eyeball forwards, downwards, and laterally. That is what you should remember. In the case of subperiosteal abscess, it is a displacement of the eyeball is forwards, downwards, and laterally, as is in this case. This is a CT scan showing you how the orbits is been, orbit has been displaced in the case of a superiostal abscess. 
let's go to the third grade that is your orbital cellulitis in which the pus breaks through the periosteum it finds its way into the orbit it spreads between the orbital fat and the muscles on examination clinical features you see edema of the lids chemosis oxophthalmos and conjunctival um, would you say conjunctival congestion vision is affected so is the movement it is dangerous because it leads to what loss of vision and meningitis if left unchecked and uncontrolled the fourth grade that is a slightly more increased dangerous version is orbital abscess which along which usually happens along the lamina papyracea the diagnosis is done by the ct scan treatment is by iv antibiotics and the drainage is also done now we have some special kinds of orbital complications called the sof syndrome or the superior orbital fissure syndrome in which there is an infection of sphenoid sinus structures are the third fourth and sixth nerve three four six and also the optic and the maxillary division of the fifth cradial nerve the trigeminal nerve the clinical features being a deep orbital pain and paralysis of the eye and frontal headache so this is your superior orbital fissure and these are all the nerves which are concerned and affected because of the superior orbital fissure syndrome now let's look at the second complication of sinusitis which is osteomyelitis where there is infection of the bone marrow of the maxillary and the frontal sinus usually maxillary usually in children complaining of erythema and swelling of cheek there is purulent nasal discharge with sequestration of bone and treatment is iv antibiotics now we should also look at certain types of tumors which is a pots puffy tumor for example in which it is actually an osteomyelitis of the frontal nerve this is a sure shot short note for you please keep all these points in mind you can also get a few um, mcqs from this particular topic it is usually seen in adults where the pus is felt externally as a soft dubby internally as an extra dural abscess the treatment is usually by iv antibiotics as usual and you may in some cases have to drain and also remove the sequestra this is a typical pots puffy tumor now let's look go to the higher grade complications which the third one happens to be intracranial complications like meningitis encephalitis subdural abscesses brain abscesses and cavernous sinus thrombosis now what is cavernous sinus thrombosis it occurs because of thrombophlebitis and the lack of valves in the veins the clinical features being abrupt chills and rigors acutely ill patient swollen eyeballs 3 4 6 cranial nerves being affected pupils being dilated and fixed csf but unnaturally remains normal and the treatment as we should remember it's a very life threatening condition a very high risk condition in which iv antibiotics are to given this is the thrombosis of the cavernous sinus it is an infection leading to a blood clot caused by complication infection paranasal or central venous sinuses this is the cavernous sinus that it gets inflamed what are the signs and symptoms of thrombosis of the cavernous sinus this is another sure shot question for you fatigue seizures vomiting impaired vision boils in the face drooping eyelids high temperature sinusitis infection of the skull severe pain and numbness of the face and infection of the eye with redness swelling and an irritation of the eyes the next sort of complications is descending infections which, which can be otitis media affecting the um, ears pharyngitis tonsillitis persistent laryngitis and tracheobronchitis focal infections like mucoceles which is another short note for you which is caused by chronic obstruction of the sinus ostium and a cystic dilatation of the mucosa the mucus gland therefore due to the obstruction of the duct filtrous uh, mucosal of the frontal sinus is of most great importance it is a most common one it can be diagnostic x-ray by the loss of scaffolding of the frontal sinus on the x-ray it displaces the orbit downwards and laterally please remember that fdl forwards downwards and laterally the cl the clinical examination shows a axial crackling and what you do is a treatment uh, by treatment is a frontoethmoidic to be open or you can do it endoscopic mucosal of other sinuses maxillary is asympt is usually asymptomatic and incidental ethmoid is recurrent infection it displaces the orbit synoid is so syndrome treatment is similar and you can get a pyoseal now let's look at a quick review of the mcqs the first mcq being which is the sinus most in involved in sinusitis it is surely and most commonly the maxillary sinus next most common sinus affected by mucosal is surely the frontal sinus document 